The first Yu-Gi-Oh game we got in the US was Yu-Gi-Oh Forbidden Memories. The second was Dark Duel Stories. My dad got me Forbidden Memories since at the time we didn't have a Game Boy. He also bought the Prima Guide for the game. I remember in that Prima Guide it had everything about Forbidden Memories and Dark Duel Stories. That guide was the only reason why I even knew this game existed. As far as I remember, there was not much advertisement about these two games outside of a game store or Shonen Jump. For a couple of years as a kid, I always had a curiosity about the other Yu-Gi-Oh game and the guide. Was it a good game? Is it better than Forbidden Memories? I see Merrick on the cover, so does the game actually follow the story? No. No, it doesn't do any of that. In fact, the game's pretty bad. So I booted up this game and I hear something familiar at the start screen. Both games were probably in production at the same time, so I think it's safe to assume that that's why these games share some of the same tracks. So Yami speaks to you for like a page of dialogue. You name your character and then that's it. You're thrown right to the menu. No tutorial to explain how the game works, and no idea how to navigate anywhere. I don't even think you have much of an idea of what you're even supposed to do in this game. Can you imagine trying to pull this off in the current gaming climate? Now personally, I wouldn't have any problems with this, except the fact that the rules in this game are completely different from the actual card game. The rules that are straight from the actual card game are as follows. You can start the game with 5 cards in your hand, drawing 1 card at the start of each of your turns. You can normal summon 1 monster per turn. If a monster has 5 stars or more, you must tribute a monster on the field to summon it. 5 to 6 stars is a tribute, 7 and up requires 2 tributes. You can destroy cards by attacking opposing monsters or by using card effects. If your monster has higher attack than their attack or defense, you win the battle and that targeted monster is destroyed. Those are the only rules that are not bastardized to oblivion. Everything else either got gutted because of limitations and or I guess for design purposes. And the game itself does nothing to explain these rules because the rules for the game are in the instruction manual. Remember those? Imagine being a kid in 2002 with limited access to the internet and didn't have a copy of the manual due to either buying the game, let's say used, or you lost the manual. Because unless you have a complete understanding on how this game works, you'll just get your shit pushed in. So let me explain the fake rules. All the cards in this game have a type and they have an alignment. So if you have the right alignment that beats a certain other alignment, your monster automatically wins the battle no matter the attack or defense between the two monsters. Now using Pokemon logic, it's safe to guess like half of the advantages, the other half is trickier. Now by looking at this, you would assume by first glance that lights beat shadow and- WRONG! You're wrong, you're wrong already. Shadow beats light, light beats fiend, fiend beats dream, dream beats shadow. You need to know how this works. Without any kind of knowledge, the game will wall you with duelists who have beat sticks that you won't be able to kill unless you either grind like crazy or you know your shit. The second change is how fusion works. Normally you would need like a specific card and two specific monsters in your hand or on the field. You activate that card, fuse the two monsters by sending them to the graveyard and you get a brand new monster that's special summon to the field which doesn't take up your normal summon. So the best case scenario would be fusion summon a monster then normal summon a monster. However, in this game, they threw one whole step away. You no longer need the card that allows the fusion to happen. Probably due to programming limitations or just putting their own spin on the mechanic, I don't know. Honestly, fusion in the real game is like inherently pretty shitty back then, so like this is better overall in the long term anyways. In the real game, you need to hope that you draw the card to fuse in the first place. In this, you can just fuse two monsters whenever the fuck you want as long as they belong to each other. However, they added some rules to balance the new spin that they have on the fusion mechanic. If you fuse with a monster on the field, the new monster can attack that turn. It's kind of reminiscent to the Battle City rules. However, if you fuse two monsters in your hand, the monster stays in your hand instead and you can't summon it until next turn. Which means now you have to pay the cost to summon it if it's a 5 star monster or higher. Fucking garbage. The third and fourth changes are how magic and trap cards work in this game. Now usually you can set spell cards or you can activate them from your hand. There's like four different magic types. 
Yo, this is Game Boy Light in the future, here to correct a small mistake that I made. There's actually six spell types, however, only three of them pretty much matter in the context of the video, and that's Equip, Continuous, and Field. Now, the same applies with trap cards. You're usually able to set up to five trap cards. However, in this game, you can only set one trap card per turn, and you can only have one at any given moment because there's only one slot for trap cards. If it's on the field after your opponent's turn, it goes away to the graveyard immediately. You also can't pick or choose when to activate the card either. So for example, if you have Mirror Force face down and they attack, you can't save the Mirror Force, it has to activate at that moment. If the conditions are met, it will force itself to activate. You would think with all these limitations and dumbass made up rules, you would think it would make the trap cards useless in this game. But no, you need these trap cards. If you don't have trap cards in this game, there's no way you're beating this. I'm sorry. Looking at the menu, there's like seven options, but only four of them matter. Campaign, construction, records, and passwords. I'll explain them all in order when I need to use them. The first is campaign. This is where you duel people from the anime, but not in the way you think. Instead of something cool like a story mode reenacting the anime, it's just you picking a duelist to play, a dialogue box, and some random stuff, and a duel. That's it. Off the top of my head, I don't think we got a Yu-Gi-Oh game with an actual story and actual rules until Nightmare Trobador, which comes out several games after Forbidden Memories and Dark Duel Stories. So if you were a Yu-Gi-Oh fan and you was hungering for like a good Yu-Gi-Oh game with a good story and good rules, actual real rules, you was not gonna eat that until like 2005 or 6, I think. Around this time, I feel most people were buying into the Yu-Gi-Oh games because they were expecting the story, the same way people bought into like Pokemon games, beat the gyms, beat the Team Rocket, beat the Elite Four champion, all that, right? You would think in a Yu-Gi-Oh game is like go to Duelist Kingdom, stop Pegasus, come to Battle City, stop Merrick, but nope, none of that. Yo, this is Game Boy Light in the future, and while editing this, I realized that I give off the vibe of like, this game is not good because it doesn't follow the rules, where that is not the case. There are plenty of Yu-Gi-Oh games that came out before Nightmare Trabador that were actually pretty good and didn't follow a lick of the rules. This one's just bad. It doesn't follow the rules and it's not a fun game in general. But just because it doesn't follow the rules doesn't mean that that's the reason why the game is bad, just to be clear. So going back to talking about the game, after you pick a duelist, you'll be greeted with the deck construction. The chest and the deck. The chest is where all the cards go, and it's actual dog shit. To be fair, this is their first try trying to make a function like this, is what I would say if Forbidden Memories didn't come out two days before with a proper chest. You can't sort the cards, each page only displays five cards, and you can't immediately switch back and forth between the chest and the deck like Forbidden Memories. What that means is that you're going to spend a lot of your time shifting and sifting through menus and cards for a while, and it gets annoying really fast. The card art for the most part is pretty good. I'm impressed with how close, if not better, that some of these cards look compared to the original card. So after looking at my cards and seeing that my deck is complete shit, I go off and do a Tristan. The presentation for this game is atrocious. You'd think they would give the same level of care and creativity they did for the cards for the thing you're gonna look at the most, the playing field. you think it would be a little bit more colorful considering it's on the Game Boy Color. Nothing is placed terribly, they did their best considering they don't have much space to work with in the first place anyways. But it looks painfully bland and the only color you'll ever get is from the cards that you play. I was hoping if you change the arena to another terrain, the background would change, but nope, it stays the same. Super strength is not enough to win games, so I pushed the shit in. You eat a glizzy, that's a violation number one. After you win a game against somebody, you win a card from their deck. You also get a card part as well. Now you're probably thinking, what the fuck is a card part? I'll get to it when the time comes. The next duelist I had to fight was Joey, and this is the point where I already had to make changes to my deck. He sometimes played the field card Meadow, which boosts the power of Warrior and Beast Warriors. At this point of the game, I don't have a single card that can overpower his monsters. I can't even make a deck with the alignment that counters his deck because I don't have cards to do that. Something to add on to all the misery as well is that this is the first time I realized how busted certain cards can be. Usually you can destroy a field spell with a card effect or by playing another field spell. But in this game, since all spell cards are normal cards, there's no way for me to target and destroy field spell cards. An entire way to counterplay a card type is now gone because of limitations. And this is not even the worst case scenario of this. 
so I was at a crossroads. Use the password system to give me a few trap cards and monster cards that can level the playing field for me, or grind and play the game without the use of... Yeah, fuck that, I went with the passwords. <laughs> Listen, I'm not gonna grind in this old ass game, alright? Even with passwords though, you'll soon realize the limitations of this. You have to put in an 8 digit code at the bottom left of a Yu-Gi-Oh card, and if it's in the game, you'll get the card. You can only use the password of each card once, so you can't get multiple copies of the same card with this. I only got 4 trap cards and a few monsters that have good effects, but why not just get all the good cards and run through the whole damn game? Well, for starters, I wanted to still have a feel for how bullshit the game is if you went vanilla. And second, you technically can't have all the best cards in one deck. You see this right here? This is what the records menu tab opens up. The key part to look at is the dual level and the deck volume. Your dual level goes up by one after a duel with any opponent. Your deck volume is the limit to how many good cards you can have. Each card shows what level you need to be to use it and how much deck volume it'll take up. Early in the game, this won't matter much, but down the line this will be important, so keep this in mind. Just know in the back of your mind that even if I wanted to cheese this game, I can't. So I go back to the campaign and I beat the shit out of Joey. It's in this duel that I realized that the most dangerous thing you could do in this game is attack a face down monster. Yeah, that's right. Even if their monster is in defense position, if you lose the type advantage, your monster dies. To alleviate this problem just a bit, if you already have a monster on the field, you can attack with that first before attacking with a new monster. Chances are, if they had the type advantage with the monster that was already on the field, they would have attacked with that monster that they put face down. At this point, Mai is probably tougher than Joey. Her Harpy Ladies are 1300 a pop. She also has a spell card that boosts them even higher. My best monsters in the deck don't even crack a thousand. So at this point in the game, my win condition in this matchup is to pray to God that she doesn't have a Harpy Lady, and if she does, maybe I have a forest monster to deal with this. At this point in the game, the only forest monster I have is this freak called Droll Bird. What a ugly ass card. I bet it's not worth shit. Oh my god. Needless to say, I lost a few games, but I got my five games from her eventually. The next opponent is Mako Tsunami. Honestly, I pushed the shit in. I think he got like one game off me because of an equip spell. That's about it. Next is Yugi Moto himself. He's probably just as bad as Tristan at this point in the game. Whoa, Yugi fucking spoilers? Jesus Christ, Yugi got so salty about the ass whooping he spoiled the goddamn story. You fucking little piece of- Oh, I got brain control. Let me just add it to my- Never mind. What a fucking tease. Next is the asshat Esperoba. Bro, I'm really about to get your pickle chin now, boy. What can I say about this guy? Yeah, there's no way I could beat this guy with this shitty ass deck. However, now is a good time to look at the other mechanic in the game. Remember the card parts? Well, it turns out that you could take two different card parts, put them together, and make a brand new custom card. The power of the card depends on the two parts you fuse. So the one right here is fucking abysmal. So instead, you'll probably find yourself sifting through all the parts that you have to see which two parts give the best results. Oh, here we go. 2000 attack power beasted which is actually fucking busted at this point of Yu-Gi-Oh. You will find yourself coming here more often the more you hit brick walls in this game. Most of the cards that you get as a reward are so ass you might as well cheat and make your own Yu-Gi-Oh cards. To be honest, the concept is actually really cool. What kid doesn't want to make their own Yu-Gi-Oh cards? But in this game, the execution is like mediocre at best. None of the cards that you make can have effects. All of them will be vanilla beat sticks. You're obviously not going to go for anything even less than 1800 attacks since there's not that many 3 or 4 star monsters in the game that even go near that threshold of attack power. The only thought process that goes into this is what element you want to choose and even then that won't really matter in the grand scheme of things. It's a cool concept but the mechanic leaves a lot more to be desired. It's a shallow mechanic in a shallow game. After going back and proving that all sidekicks are fucking fake, I play against Rex and Weevil. These two would be a big problem if I didn't make custom cards, since their B-Sticks are stronger than all the cards you probably have, excluding the custom cards. In fact, I found myself losing the game if I didn't draw a custom card. 
Rex, on one hand, has a bunch of Earth cards with some Forest sprinkled in to counter your Wind cards. And Weevil has a bunch of Forest cards and some Water cards to handle your Pyro cards. It's pretty cool that some of the duelists in this game have countermeasures to their weaknesses instead of having like Gym Leader Syndrome. However, by this point, you probably have enough B-Sticks to make this not even matter. So you're probably thinking at this point, can the custom cards carry you through the whole game? Hell no. no, 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 fuck no, they can't. I was starting to think the same thing at this point in the game until I dueled this punk ass bitch. Fucking Seeker. This is the part of the game where you might want to use some brain power. Damn, literally multiple hours into this game and this is the first time I have to actually think mid-duel instead of just throwing down beat sticks on the fucking board and just swinging. The first problem with this guy is his monsters. They all have enormous amounts of defense. My 2000 attack beat sticks can't be over that. Most of his high defense monsters are earth, so you can get around it by having a wing card, but this is where it gets stupid. This is the first opponent to have Raigeki. Raigeki is a magic card that destroys all monsters your opponent controls, so if you decided to bust all over the board, just know there's a risk of lightning striking down and making you lose a shitload of card advantage. And he ain't the only one with it. From this point on, every duelist has three copies of Raigeki. Now there's only two ways to play around Raigeki. The first is to not play all of your best cards and slowly pace yourself throughout the duel. The second is using a trap card called Anti-Raigeki. It reverses the effects of Raigeki if they activate it and blows up their monsters instead. Now Solution 2 has a problem. Remember, trap cards can only be set on the field for one turn. So you have to preemptively set Anti-Raigeki the turn you feel like the computer is about to use Raigeki. What? That is incredibly stupid because you have no idea if they even have the card in their hand or not. Now to get around that problem, you can set it and then bust all over the board. That way by the time next turn hits, you can just end the game. Now honestly, the Seeker doesn't even have a win condition besides Exodia, if Exodia is even in this game, so he really just wastes your time for like 5 duels straight. However, it does prepare you with a certain mindset, cause now the game is gonna throw all the bullshit at you. And you need to start thinking this way before you get this shit thrown at you, so that way you can like throw shit right back at it. The next duelist is Arcana. Uh, I mean, Pandora? This guy's an asshole. Three copies of Dark Hole. Think right Gaggy, except everyone gets the dick. The other problem is the monsters he has in his deck. He has a deck full of shadow monsters. Shadow type is probably the most problematic type in this game. Now dream cards are the only cards that can beat shadow monsters. If only this game would give you a dream card. Most dream cards are horrendously bad and they're rare as hell. I think off the top of my head in my whole playthrough I had two dream cards with one of them being like a custom card. Pandora has equipped spells and field spells. The monsters in this deck will run over your monsters every now and then. If one of his shadow monsters get over 2000 attack power, you might as well scoop up the duel. Even if he had a dream monster and or a strong monster, his dark hole says otherwise. I forget to mention that after you beat some of the rare hunter duelists, you get a message from Merrick every now and then. So you get a little bit of lore, but not enough to make this game worth playing. Now it's time to duel the man himself, Kaiba. I was expecting a lot of bullshit, but Kaiba is pretty tame compared to Pandora. As long as you don't give him space, you can bag him pretty easily. The next stage after that is Egypt, and it's the last stage in the entire game. One of the opponents is a familiar face to most people in the Yu-Gi-Oh community, Simon McMoron. Uh, no? I don't blame you. He's a video game only character that pops up in a lot of older Yu-Gi-Oh games. Alright, so let me give you the scoop. First problem is Crush Card. If you're a Yu-Gi-Oh veteran, you probably know what the actual card effect is. But, in this game, it's just Dark Hole, but only for monsters with 1500 attack or higher. The second card is Spellbinding Circle. And again, this card doesn't do what it actually does. This is a reoccurring theme and it only gets worse from here, man. In this game, it decreases the opponent's monster's attack power by 500. All of them. This is a very dangerous card but not as big as a problem as brain control. And quite to my surprise, it actually does what it's supposed to do, which is basically take one opponent's card and you just take control of it for one turn. The games with this guy consist of him whittling you down with these annoying ass magic cards. 
Before you can kinda avoid bad situations, but now there's no telling what the fuck happens in these games. You play too passive, you run the risk of him actually drawing the cards he needs. If you play too aggressive, you run the risk of losing all your cards. Overall, it's better to just hold your resources, but it gets really difficult to pick and choose spots. Not to mention that his cards are beat sticks, so you have to invest more into card fusions and card parts. I didn't really mention how often you actually can make a good custom card. By the end of a stage, you can make a good custom card. Two at best if you're lucky. After 50 plus duels, I only had about four to five good custom cards. Keep in mind that this is on top of having good effect monsters and trap cards that I can actually afford to put in my deck. Without all of this, it's extremely unlikely that you'll get out of this without any brain damage whatsoever. Keep in mind that at this point in the game, I lost a good handful to some of these duelists. Like, I didn't just win five times in a row and then just moved on to the next stage. Like, I was definitely losing like about like five to ten games to each of these dudes. It's Kaiba. Again. And he's probably just as easy as the normal Actually, never mind. He has some bullshit too. This is the first time you see a bullshit card called Megamore. It increases the attack power of one monster by 500, which isn't much, but I can assure you this can snowball the game right into hell. But also, this is the first appearance of one of the two most busted cards in this game. Change of heart. This card can suck my ass. It has the wrong effect. In the real life card game, you steal a monster for one turn. That's it, just one turn. You have the monster for one turn, you can attack with it, you can trigger it, you can do whatever the fuck you want for one turn. In this game, however, you keep the monster until it dies. There is no counterplay or strategy to get around this card. You could try not to play your biggest monsters first, but at this point in the game, their beat sticks are as big as yours. In these situations, you have to play your big cards and you have to pray to God that they don't have change of heart. His deck is actually the same deck as Kaiba's. It's just ramped up with all these bullshit magic and trap cards. Unlike what he's saying, I was going 50-50 with this guy. Don't fucking listen to this dude, all right? The duels at this point in the game are not even remotely fun. Before, I had a few kicks here and there in stage 1 and 2, but stage 3 is just full of so much bullshit. Too many games are determined by whether they have certain magic cards in their hand or not. Isn't that the nature of the game? Yeah, but we're not on equal footing. I can't even run one copy of Change of Heart in my deck, even if I wanted to, because the deck cost of this card is so fucking high. The only way I can even put it in my deck is by taking out every card, putting in Change of Heart, and then 39 shit cards. And that's not even worth it. These assholes get to have 3 Change of Hearts, 3 Right Gaggies, 3 Dark Holes, and who knows whatever the fuck else. Meanwhile, I only have Mr. Tomato Head and Pals, and a sprinkle of Magic and Trap cards. At this point in the game, it's just gonna be like the story of David and Goliath. It's just me hoping to get a lucky shot with my sling shit of a deck. After a grueling back and forth with Seto, I come across the biggest brick wall ever in this game. Ishizu. Remember when I said Change of Heart was one of the two most busted cards in this game? She has a card that's so sacky and gives her so much time to get whatever the fuck she needs. Swords of Revealing Light. It does exactly what it does in the real life card game in this game. Kind of. See, when activated and face up on the field, your opponent can attack for three turns. However, in this game, it does not stay face up on the field. So in real life, the card's weakness is that you can destroy it while it's face up on the field, and the effect just goes away immediately. In this game, there is no doing that. Because magic cards don't stay up on the field due to whatever the fuck limitations. You have to hold the swords in your fucking throat for three turns. No ifs. No ands, no buts. While you sit on your ass for three turns, they draw three cards and probably summon three monsters. It's so free, so busted, and you can't even use it. You can have it, sure, but the deck cost is so high for this card, you might as well forget the thought of even having one. In fact, the game is set up in a way where you can't really have three copies of any of the best cards in the game anyways. Meaning no matter how much you grind, you will never truly be able to be on equal terms with any of these opponents. All the games from this point on start to feel like you're playing with a handicap. The only thing you could even do at this point is flush this game down the toilet. Or you hold that shit and you just keep going. 
But at this point, you have to ask yourself, which option does like a seven, eight year old who had this game on the Game Boy Color even choose, right? More than likely, most people who had this game as a kid just fucking scooped or didn't even get this far, I'ma be honest. At this point, no matter how hard I try, I kept getting smoked by her. These duels were like 70-30 in her favor. She has three copies of the best magic cards in this game. Now think about that for a second. If she has three copies of Swords of Revealing Light, that means she gets free nine free fucking turns to just twerk on my ass and do whatever the fuck she wants. Even the custom cards and passwords couldn't save me at this point in the game. So my last and final resort was to make an actual deck. I needed to actually overhaul the fuck out of my whole deck and make a consistent strategy with that. Was I not already doing that, you ask? Kind of. The problem I'm having here is that I have to depend on drawing enough beat sticks to outlast her magic cards. The problem was drawing the fusion fodder at the wrong times. My deck up until this point, besides the custom cards, which I only have like four or five of them in the deck, were a bunch of monsters that can fuse with each other to make certain monsters. It was like a variety toolbox. The problem was that sometimes I would get certain monsters at the wrong time. So instead of making a variety of fusion monsters to make, I chose to have only one or two fusion monsters to make, and those two fusion monsters have to share the same monsters. That way I can have a consistent strategy. If I don't have a beat stick card, I can fuse these two monsters and it'll make one of these two fusions. Now I think at first I was focusing on Mystical Sand and Stone Dragon. Mystical Sand only needs a Earth or a Rock and a female card and it makes her. Stone Dragon only needs like an Earth and Rock card or something like that and it makes him. However, in the long run, I had to give up on that idea of making both of them because the problem arose where that there would be turns where I had a female and a dragon card. I can't fuse a female and a dragon card to make anything in this game. So one of them had to give. And I had more female cards than dragon cards. I got rid of all the dragon cards and I just kept a bunch of rock and female cards to make mystical sand whenever I needed. After the changes, my chances went from a whopping 30% to 50%. I was still losing pretty badly, but the consistency was a noticeable change. I got the games with her and the next person after her is Haishin, which is like another video game character only thing. He's like similar to the difficulty of Seto, but because of all the deck changes I did, I destroyed the shit out of him. Like these changes were made to keep up, not even to beat, to keep up with Ishizu. Ishizu is so much more harder than everybody in this stage. After you beat everyone in this stage five times, you get to fight the Dark Knight. My guess at the time was that Yu-Gi-Oh was finished at the time in Japan in the manga, maybe anime too. So instead of like using Zork as the end-all be-all demon that was sealed behind the Millennium items, it was the Dark Knight. This was the end game boss for like most Yu-Gi-Oh games at the time and each iteration also shared one common thing besides being incredibly evil. He's fucking broken. So get this, not only does he have the best magic cards in the game, he has the biggest beat stick in the game. This card is such a problem. With him stealing my cards with either brain control or change of sack, stalling to summon big monsters because of sort of revealing light, and having just a dumb amount of border wipes from Raigeki to Dark Hole to a Crush card, it's really a toss up against this guy. You can either draw good enough to last the War of Attrition or get your shit pushed in immediately. At this point, I changed the deck one last time to try and even the odds. At this point in the game, I think I had a high enough duelist level to run Spellbinding Circle and Crush card. I also added Wastelands and some high defense rock types. If he's gonna stall with Swords of Revealing Light, the best I can do is probably play these monsters in defense mode with high ass defense so I can stall with him. I put some wing cards so I can beat over some of the rock types that he can steal with Change of Heart, some more female cards to make Mystical Sand, and the custom cards I started to focus on making was anything that could get a boost in weight slams. Anything that could get over 2000 with the boost, I took. And again, my chances just shot up. Before the changes, it legit felt like I would win like one game out of five. But now it's more of like a back and forth. It feels like a 50-50. And there you have it. I finally beat this cheating ass bitch five times. But wait, where the fuck is Merrick? Where's Yami Yugi? 
They're on the cover of the game, so... What the fuck? Where are they? Oh, man, you're not gonna like this. So let me explain this dumb shit. So the Dark Knight is the final duel of this stage. After you beat him five times, you get a password. What does the password do? It unlocks the credits. I'm dead serious. It's the credits. In doing so, you officially beat the game. But if you want more bang for your buck, you can duel the Dark Knight and win five more times to get another password. And with that, you can duel the secret duelist of the game. Or you can just look up the passwords on the internet. There really is no point to have such a roundabout way to duel Yugi or Merrick. It makes no sense. In fact, the stupidest part is that there's five more secret duelists. Each stage has five duelists. Why the fuck did you not just make this a stage? It looks like a way to prolong the game's playtime, but it's in the worst way possible. Anyways, you want to know about the last five? Honestly, at this point, I didn't really have a need to duel and beat them all five times. There's really no reason to beat them five times at this point. You could get just beat them once and move on with your day. So I played each one in like a best of three, and I just beat them all. All the decks that they had were similar, to the point where that there's no need for me to explain the duels that I had with them. Maybe if each computer opponent used like different card effects to make themselves different from the last one, if that was the case, I would have gone into detail about it. My best duel was probably with Merrick, it's probably the most exciting duels I had in this game overall, but that's all I gotta say about this game. Overall, it's not worth going through this game in like today, like maybe if you want to go back for nostalgia and you played this game as a kid, but as like someone who like wants to like explore Yu-Gi-Oh games and try to play them all or something like that or like you're into older Yu-Gi-Oh games or just something retro stuff or whatnot whatever whatever reason you will come across to like come across this game and even think about playing it it's not worth it it's not worth your time it's not worth your brain power it's not fun it's not bad I'll say that much it was entertaining at times but like I don't think the entertainment the few moments of entertainment was worth the amount of time I put into the game Besides like making this video, of course, I guess that's like the payoff, just making this video to talk about this game of series that I love. Anyways, thanks for watching everybody. It's been fun making this video for the most part. I was hoping it wouldn't be as long as like the last video I had, but damn, this shit is reaching almost, almost 40 minutes. Peace out. I'll catch you in another video. I'll probably talk about another Yu-Gi-Oh game at some point or something, you know?